With DC Entertainment's Shazam and Marvel Studios' Captain Marvel filming currently underway with the duo of Zachary Levi, Asher Angel, and Brie Larson, respectively, the question of who the real Captain Marvel is has risen once again. Debate about the original, who should be called what, and just where the rights lie have been the focus of heated debate for fans on both sides of the discussion. In this video, we'll unpack the history of the name, the characters, and how we wind up in a world where two movies featuring different Captain Marvels will be released from competing studios just one month apart. Hi, I'm Jesse. Thanks for pressing play. You're watching JLS Comics, a channel that's all about comic books, movies, superheroes, games, anime, comic cons, you know, all the good stuff. Our story begins all the way back in 1938 a year before the start of World War II and with the release of Action Comics number 1 in June of that year. The launch of the title and Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster's new character, Superman, proved to be a wild and smashing success. The Action Comics titles were selling millions of copies from newsstands all over America and other publishers started scrambling to create their own superheroes to capture their share of this success. And one of these characters, created by Will Eisner for Bruns Publications called Wonder Man, Victor Fox saw the sales figures for Action Comics and immediately decided he wanted to expand his business into comic books. But national periodicals, what would become DC Comics, were also scrambling not to create new characters, but their efforts were to squash the copycat characters and to protect their copyrights and market share via court and cease and desist letters. When Wonder Comics number one hit newsstands in 1939, DC immediately sued Fox, citing copyright infringement. We have compared the alleged infringing magazine of bronze with the issues of action comics and are satisfied that the finding of bronze copied the pictures in the complainant's periodical is amply substantiated was an excerpt from the court proceeding. And in this case, Detective Comics Inc. versus Bruns Publications went to Second Circuit Court in 1940, established the precedent for a future case that we'll talk about in a moment. And it's here that we learn that the characters found in these comic strips are in fact protected under copyright law. Now, Wonder Man appeared in Wonder Comics number one in March of 1939. It was a year after action. DC's injunction actually stopped further issues from being released before the impending lawsuit got started. And consequently, that first issue is the one and only appearance of Wonder Man, making him a very small, albeit very important, footnote to our story. Now, around the same time, another publication company founded by a World War I Army vet, Captain Wolford Hamilton Fawcett, otherwise known as Captain Billy, was getting started. He also employing his four sons who took over the company when Captain Billy died in 1940. It was Roscoe Fawcett who said to his staff, give me a Superman, only have his other identity be a 12 year old boy rather than a man. Roscoe's plan went to a writer named Bill Parker and an artist named Cece Beck. Parker wanted to make an entire team who would be led by Captain Thunder and who would each invoke the powers of a mythological being. It was editor Ralph Day who said, hey Bill, why don't we combine this team of five into just one hero instead? So Bill took Day's idea and made one Captain Thunder. Unfortunately, the name Captain Thunder was already trademarked by another publisher, so another revision was in order. So Captain Marvel became Captain Marvelous. And then finally, the editor Ralph shortened it to Captain Marvel, and this was just in time for his first appearance in Wiz Comics number two. And the story about a boy named Billy Batson, whose name is inspired by the founder, Captain Billy's name, imbued with the magic powers of the wizard Shazam, was an instant success with young readers. I mean, who, who at 12 years old wouldn't want to be able to invoke the powers of the Greek gods to become a Superman? This orphan newsboy had this great power at his disposal. He spoke to readers via Wiz radio narration in the over half a million copies that sold of that first appearance. The Big Red Chief which was an epithet given to Captain Marvel by his arch nemesis, Dr. Savannah, went to outpace even Superman himself. Superman was being published in Superman since 1939 and via news strip by the McClure newspaper syndicate. And these were six months later reprinted in action comics. Now for the next couple of years, Captain Marvel was the best-selling character of the golden age and the prize title of Fawcett Publications. His mythos was quickly expanded and in 1941, he had his own title called Captain Marvel Adventures, which was published alongside the continuing Wiz comics. In 1942, Otto Binder, 
expanded their franchise even further to include Mary Marvel, Captain Marvel Jr., and even a pet named Hoppy the Marvel Bunny. Now here's where we enter Republic Pictures. On multiple occasions, Republic attempted to acquire the motion picture rights to National Periodical's Superman character, but the rights had already been granted exclusively to Paramount, so they were ultimately unsuccessful of that. But what they did was reach out to Fawcett for the rights to Captain Marvel, and thus the Adventures of Captain Marvel serial debuted in 1941, earning it the title of the first ever film adaptation of a comic book character. Now, smartly, part of the contract with Fawcett was for legal protection, and we're going to come to that in a moment here. But the film serial was a box office success. That same year, National sued Fawcett and Republic for copyright infringement. At the same time, Republic sued Fawcett to invoke their production under the terms of their contract for the filming. And this started, like I said, in 1941. Pre-litigation trial continued. Revision was submitted back in 1945 when Detective Comics Inc. and Superman Inc. merged into national periodicals to be one complainant. And the case was finally brought to trial in 1948. But by that time, Captain Marvel Adventures was selling over a million copies monthly and it had even surpassed Superman in popularity. The case cited as the basis for copyright infringement was National versus Bruns, that first case we mentioned. Fawcett argued that proper copyright was not applied when Action reprinted the strips from the McClure comic strips in their newspapers. If you watched my How DC Comics Save Marvel Comics video, and there's a link here, you'll know that this was also a time in the early 1950s when comic book content was under fire by the Wortham crowd. Anything but really like biblical content, wholesome superheroes were under attack, as was the publishing industry as a whole. Publishing uh, companies were closing, the sales were massively dropping, and Fawcett was also a casualty of this effort. Now they were facing massive sales decreases and this seemingly endless lawsuit with National. So Fawcett agreed to settle out of court for $400,000 and also agreed to cease publication of anything related to Captain Marvel. In 1953, the last Captain Marvel publication was released with a book called The Marvel Family, issue number 89. And an interesting side note here is that a UK publisher named L. Miller and Son had been consistently publishing Fawcett reprints in England. And once the lawsuit concluded, Led Miller turned to a British writer named Mick Anglo, uh, transformed Captain Marvel into Marvel Man, who would later become Miracle Man. Now, since the length of a trademark term is 10 years, and since Fawcett abandoned Captain Marvel, the Captain Marvel trademark expired in 1963. And at this time, Marvel, which was incidentally being distributed through national periodicals, was seeing a massive increase in sales and popularity. And around that time that their agreement ceased, 1967 to be exact, Marvel Comics trademarked the name for a now famous alien Kree character that would appear in Marvel Super Heroes number 12. And it might have been the 1966 MF Enterprises ripoff Captain Marvel that prompted Stanley and Martin Goodman to seek protection of the name. The character was made by the creator of the original Human Torch, but this Captain Marvel had head, legs, and arm that could be separated from his body to fight. Really strange. And he teamed up with an Earth boy named Billy Baxton. Yeah, I know. Captain Marvel had been after that referenced many times in many of the fanzines that were popping up, and especially Roy Thomas's alter ego and Fawcett Collectors of America. Marvel would continue to use the name despite a lack of popularity simply to retain their trademark. Five years later, in 1972 to be exact, DC Comics acquired the per-use licensing all of the original Fawcett characters, which included Captain Marvel, and it was part of their ongoing attempts to revitalize sales, as I discussed in my How Marvel Saved DC video. Full rights eventually landed with DC a few years later when Jeanette Kahn attempted to relaunch the title, and the irony there shouldn't really be lost on anybody. Shazam number one from 19. 1972 has the honor of being one of the first speculator books, according to Mark Wade, as Captain Marvel was introduced on the cover by Superman himself, but the title didn't quite catch on, and a returning, apparently, CC back was hard to work with, uh, even bringing back Scheffenberger with a retro look. That uh, really didn't help because it wasn't consistent with the style of the 70s, and they lapsed into reprints, and uh, really, it was the Shazam Isis Hour live-action TV show that kept the book alive. Now, the way the trademark was set 
setup was that only Marvel could use the name Captain Marvel on the covers of the books. DC could continue to use the names on the interiors of the books or in the filmation episodes. They were the ones who made the live action TV show and they did, but the book had to be called something else. They landed on Captain Marvel's invocation and entitled the book Shazam. And it had a subtitle, which was the original Captain Marvel, but they were hit with a cease and desist from Marvel. Even the toys and merchandise at the time lacked that Marvel, Captain Marvel labeling and they opted for Shazam, Mary, Captain Junior labeling. But this allowed them to publish books and sell merch for these characters. But what this did also was create a perception in consumers' minds that the character himself was named Shazam. Now in 2011, as part of DC's New 52 marketing campaign, this character was officially renamed Shazam by Jeff Johns and it would streamline the titles and make marketing for the planned Shazam movie much simpler. And over the years, there's been many incarnations and copycats. You have Prime, Supreme, there was a black leather clad Mary Marvel, you have Monica Rambeau, Tom Strong, most recently uh, Carol Danvers who will be the one in the Marvel Captain Marvel movie. But in the hearts and minds of DC fans, Billy Batson will always be Captain Marvel. So there you have it. That's the history of the name Captain Marvel, the battle of the publishers for the name itself, and DC's ultimate repositioning for the modern age. But let me know what you think in the comments down below and if this is your first time here, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be part of the JLS Comics family and thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.